Well, everybody, thanks for coming tonight. Um, just want to welcome Ona Hurley, who's going to speak on BCAR and uh, universal design. Um, thank you very much, Owen. Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, just, I suppose, the, the title of tonight's presentation, The Implications of Building Control Regulations in, in um, on Accessibility and Universal Design. Uh, I suppose start by saying today actually is the International Day of uh, People with Disabilities, uh, the UN. Uh, International Day is always on the 3rd of December, so it's a, a good night to have the, the, the presentation. Um, so just just quickly, just a quick overview of what we hope to cover in the presentation itself. Um, just a quick introduction and context to the whole area of, of disability and, and, and access. Um, and then a quick overview of what is accessibility or, or how people actually perceive um, accessibility. It's important, I suppose, to give, a, give an overview about universal design given that it is written into part M of the building regulation, so it is a policy in, in, the, in part M. Um, a, a, an overview on, on the BCAR, which you're all very familiar with, so I don't really need to go into too much detail there, but also in relation to uh, part M 2010 and the key, key requirements. Um, and I suppose just following on, the main part of the presentation, I suppose what I want to highlight is where accessibility can go wrong uh, during, I suppose, the planning stages, design, construction, uh, and handover of, of, of projects. Um, and I've just given some real life examples of some, some of the projects that we've been working on recently where some of the mistakes may have been made in relation to the uh, accessibility uh, requirements. So that's just a quick overview of, of what I'd like to, to cover in the presentation. So I suppose quickly just to set the scene, uh, it, there's a, it's estimated in the world that 1 million people, so 15% uh, of the world's population are living with a disability. Uh, that's according to the United Nations and the World Health Organization. People with disabilities are actually the largest minority group within within the world. Um, you can see in the European Union it's estimated 15 to 20 percent, which is about 80 million people in Europe living uh, with a disability. If you go out then you can see the census figures which was which was carried out by the CSO in 2011 identified 13 percent of the population living with a disability. Um, the types of disability range from physical, sensory, mental health and intellectual impairment. So quite, quite uh, across a broad spectrum and I suppose just to be just to be clear one percent of the population so one of the 13 percent that you have up on the screen there are wheelchair users so you know it's a common misconception when you talk about disability that people are thinking about wheelchair users but it's only one percent of the population are actually wheelchair users so there's another 12 percent uh, people with sensory disabilities people with other physical impairments and so on um, the other thing is we're living in a, in, a, in a world, I suppose, where the, where the population is aging. So there's a massive demographic shift towards what's known as the aging uh, aging population. Uh, and that, that is quite important as well. So I suppose the key message here is that, you know, at least 13% of the population are living with a disability. 1% of those are, are wheelchair users or are, are have physical access uh, requirements. Um, in relation to why accessibility or why, 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 we need to, why we need to consider access, they say that there's four cases. They go from the social case down as far as the moral case. And there's also the diversity of the population where I suppose we're saying no two people are, are the same. The social case is, there's a few um, things to consider here. One, we just mentioned 13% of the Irish population, which is about 600,000 people living with a disability. The second thing is, I suppose, everyone is going to benefit from good accessibility. So whether you're a parent, you know, if you're a parent with young kids um, and you, you, you've come to a building with a, with a buggy, you know about accessibility if there are steps up at the main entrance. If you're living in an apartment and your lift is, is broken down, you know all about accessibility and, and, and so on. The other, the other part about the social case, which I mentioned, was the ageing population. So it's, it's estimated currently that there's about 535,000 people over 65 in Ireland. But by 2041, they estimate it's going to be 1.4 million people. So we're going from 535,000 to 1.4 million people over the age of 65. Uh, as more and more people get older, and it's, a, I suppose, a well-known fact, people are going to end up having reduced vision, reduced hearing, reduced dexterity in their hands, or reduced mobility and things like that. So I suppose that's another reason why accessibility um, is, is important. We also have the legal case. Um, and as you all will be aware of the building control, uh, uh, build, building regulations, so we've got Part M, which is a, our, our, our the Building Control Act, and we've got Part M, which is a, our building regulation. So that's one reason for the legal case. The second reason, the second piece of legislation to be aware of is the Equal Status Act. Um, and basically what the Equal Status Act says is you cannot discriminate against people with disabilities in the provisions of goods and services. 
and most of your um, most of your clients, if you're if you're if you're on a design team and you're building a new leisure center or you're building a new cinema or a, a new restaurant and, and things like that, there's going to be services provided in, in those buildings. So it's very important that you're aware of the Equal Status Act that you cannot discriminate against people with disabilities. There's an other other of a grounds there as well, members of the traveling community, religious belief, sexual orientation, and so on. Uh, in relation to the business case, I suppose the real bottom line is that if you make your premises accessible, then you're going to have more customers, at least 13% more customers. Um, skipping on to the diversity of the population, really what we're saying is that no two people are going to be the same. We're not going to have the same overall height, overall weight, arm length, leg length, and so on. Um, and the diversity of the population is that there are statistics in Europe to say that uh, at least 40% of the population are, no, are, are what's known as people with reduced mobility and that 40% of the population will benefit from good access. So 1% wheelchair users, 40% of people with reduced mobility and I suppose that's one of the key reasons why uh, accessibility is important. So that's just to set the context about why access is, is, is important. I suppose the other thing is what is accessibility and if you do, like we do a lot of training courses and in the training courses we start off by doing an exercise where we get people to look at making a cinema accessible. And the first thing they start thinking about is things like ramps, toilets, car parking, and uh, maybe public transport and, and, and things like that. And the main reason it is, is again, it's back to the wheelchair wheelchair user. Um, so wheelchair access is, is the common uh, uh, theme for, for accessibility. It's changing in the last few years, but I suppose that was the, 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 the scene before that. But accessibility, again, it's much more than just the building as well. It's about the services that are provided within the building. It's about, for example, if staff are trained at welcoming people with disabilities in buildings, then the service is going to be improved for, for people. It's about the image of the Cliffs of Moher website there, which is providing pre-visitor information, which allows people with disabilities to plan their journeys and so on. It's about having good public transport to allow people to get to the buildings and, 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 and things like that. And it's, it's about having good information at the site as well. So, for example, uh, people with vision impairments may need menus in larger in larger print in restaurants and things like that so i suppose really what we're saying here is accessibility goes across a wide range of of issues whether it's from information provision to customer services to designing buildings to make them accessible and so on and it's also about ensuring that the facilities within the buildings are fully accessible to meet the needs of, of the ranging users and so on so i suppose really got moving away from the ramp and toilet approach towards accessibility for all people uh, regardless of their age their size and their disability and that's where the principle of universal design comes in. So we'll, we'll talk about universal design in, in a second, but I suppose just quickly who benefits from good access. Um, and you can see, we'll just use an example of a third level institution. So people attending UCD or, or, or somewhere like that, um, who benefits from good access? It's the students with disabilities. It's the older lady who might be attending a, a, an event in, on a Saturday night. It's the foreign <coughs> students where English may not be their first language they're going to benefit from good signage and wayfinding and so on. It's the first time visitor, He's a, he or she is a key person because you know, you've all experienced coming to a building for the first time and having difficulty finding the toilets or finding the way around to the, you know, you, you're, you're going to a conference and you're trying to find the, the conference room and things like that. It could be the, the visiting lecturers or it could be the parent who's attending a graduation and who's never been on the campus before and is having difficulty finding car parking. So I suppose really what we're saying is that from an accessibility point of view, Everyone here today and everyone online, I suppose, is going to benefit from good accessibility at some stage uh, or, or another. In relation to universal design, I suppose I just really want to highlight universal design because I suppose it's a, it's a principle that has been uh, developed and written into Irish legislation over the last few years. So it's written into the Disability Act, but it's also written into Part M, or uh, the technical guidance document, TGDM, um, on page 9 and 10. So if you, if you read the, the version on the bottom, the easy to read version as I call it, it says universal design refers to the design and composition of an environment so that it can be accessed and understood and used to the greatest extent possible by all people regardless of their age, their size or disability. And the requirements of part M, so M1 to M4 of the building regulations are built around the principle of universal design. So if you go on to your, if you read your technical guidance document, it says that the principles of Part M are all about access for all people, regardless of their age, their size, or their disability. So it could be a person of smaller stature, it could be an, old, an older lady, it could be someone with a, with a sensory disability such as a visual impairment. One thing I suppose I'd say there is when you look at the technical guidance document, it still focuses a lot on disability access. It doesn't focus on the age 
or the size so that may be something that in the in the next version or, or the next um revisions of the requirements or the guidance that might might that may need to be looked at so uh, i suppose it's still focused on disability even though it's 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 talking about age and size as well so universal design then and how it's how it's uh, this is just an example of universal design oxo who are the provider of um everything from your potato peeler to your your measuring jug they they base all their they design all their products around the area of universal design um, and you can read the text there it says the principles for oxo the principles of universal design means a salad spinner that can be used with one hand liquid measuring cups that can be read from above without bending over uh, kettles with whistle, with whistle lids that open automatically when tipped to pour and pressure absorbing uh, handles and, and things like that on the on the potato peeler as i mentioned and so on the reason for the gloves in the photograph is what they're saying is no one size no one size fits all uh, and that's i suppose around the principles of of universal design some other examples um again for those of you who have young kids you know all about going to the, the chain going to the leisure center and trying to change the kids and then put if the kid is one or two they're running around the place and you need to get changed yourself so a good example of universal design there is the the simple seat that's uh, uh, fixed onto the wall that you can strap the kid in and get get yourself changed while they're uh, um, not running around the place on the wet floors and so on other example of that would be some of the, ch the leisure centers will provide a, a cot uh, that assists people again with um you know so you can put the kid into it and, and, and so on good example of universal design you've got the visual uh, fire fire alarm so again that's going to assist someone with a with a with a hearing impairment if they can't hear the fire alarm they're working in an office it's five o'clock on a friday um, they they can they can see the flashing strobe and so on. There's all there's also new systems in, in place like um, vibrating pagers where if you go into a, a build a public building or an office you get you get the pager it's linked to the fire alarm and again it assists people with uh, again if you have some if someone with even hearing and vision impairment the, the pager will work there. The third example of universal design and you is the is the shower on the right hand side and on the shower you can kind of see that they've they've quite creatively put in the, the grab rails on the wall so they've made it a feature within the within the um, shower and again that that will assist older people it could assist the uh, uh, people who are unsteady on their feet and so on but they've done it quite cleverly it's a good example of universal design ikea uh, the instructions so it doesn't matter if your if your first language is french spanish or english you know the whole idea here is that there's no there's no text it's it's all pictograms and hopefully you can put the stuff together uh, without having to unscrew it and take it apart and things like that which is what most people do the, con the control crossing which is the blue and yellow guy in the middle good example of universal design if you've ever you, the next time you come across one you will see on the on the top of the controller there's a, a an embossed an embossed arrow and that's telling a person uh, the direction of travel there's there's three bits of information there's um, audible announcements there's visual announcements and there's tactile announcements uh, from that controller so again if you are if you have a vision impairment and a hearing impairment you can feel the pulse and so on and um, but also on the yellow part of the of the um the control uh, the controller there there's also raised um symbols on it and that tells a person how wide the crossing point is it tells them that there's a two lanes coming from one direction and one lane coming from the other you can't see it there but it, it's a good example of, of universal design and the last one i just put is a, is the is the car uh, it's a, at a beach and it's really showing that the by by stopping the cars from going up onto the footpath, you're ensuring that the, the 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 width of the footpath is well maintained. So another good example of of a, I suppose universal design. So really, I suppose just to bear in mind that Part M or our building regulations are based around the principles of universal design, uh, and it's not just about disability access; it's access for all people, uh, and that will become more apparent as we, we go through the presentation. So moving on to part M, 2010 TGDM and, and, and the building control amendment regulations. Um, I suppose if, if you were to ask a few years ago, how did people think about accessibility or how did people incorporate accessibility into their, into their work? So design teams and uh, architects and, 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 and consultants and so on. They would have said that, first of all, they would have been looking at the wheel, wheelchair, wheelchair accessibility. Um, they would have complied with the, with the building regulations here on top. So they would have looked at M1 to M4 of the regulations. How they would have done that is they would have used TGDM 2010, and then they would have applied for your your disability access or tear on the bottom. So the, you know, up to a few years ago, that's how that those were the key stages when accessibility was considered. Just up when 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 you were applying for your disability access or it may not have been considered throughout construction or 
a, a handover and things like that. But I think things have changed quite a lot a, 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 in the last few years. But that's how people may have been thinking about how accessibility affects affects their work. And I, I'd say as, a, as an access consultant, in a lot of projects we would have done in the past, we were only brought in a, 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 in, in the area of the, of the disability access or to uh, I think I think people felt that the building would be accessible at, after that. So, um, so as I mentioned, we've got four requirements of the building regulations M1 to M4. Uh, you you you've all seen them before, but the key key difference between Part M2000 or M1 2000 and M1 2010 is that the M M1 2010 is access for all for people. So there's no mention of people with disabilities in the in the in the requirement M1. And as I mentioned, if you go to your technical guidance document page nine, nine or ten, it tells you that it's all people regardless of their age, their size, or their disability, and it relates to the principle of universal design. The second thing is that the old uh, part M or the old requirements of part M just related to the building. So if you went to the guidance document, it would have only said, "Look, make the make the ramp at the entrance accessible, make the steps, uh, you know, put some visual contrast and nosings on the steps, <coughs> provide a ramp, and provide a." provide a lift and, and things like that. Whereas the new part M, uh, or we call it the new part M, it's five years old now, um, it, it includes facilities and environs. So that is quite important. It extends to the boundary of the site, looking at your car parking, look at your, looking at your set down areas um, and so on. So we'll just have a quick run, run through some of that in a minute. But I suppose to remember it extends to the boundary of the site. So all approach routes, all circulation routes within the site need to be made uh, accessible. In relation to building an extension, you have to adequately allow people to, to uh, access the extension of the building. There's two ways of doing that. One would be by providing a new entrance in the extension itself, or the second way might be to actually uh, modify the existing approach uh, or the existing access into the building to, to, uh, to allow access from, from the main entrance of the building to the extension itself. M3 relates to sanitary facilities. So if, you, if there are sanitary facilities provided within a building, that's to be extended. Adequate sanitary facilities must be provided within the extension. Again, there's two ways of doing that. Provide new toilets within the extension or possibly modify the ones in the, in the existing area. And something that comes up quite, quite regularly is when people are, 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 are using our services is they, they're not aware that, you know, if you want to know how many toilets are required in the building, you, you go to Part G of the regulations or you go to TGD, uh, TGDG or the, or the British standards and so on. So, Again, that's just something to, to part M doesn't actually define the number of, of accessible toilets that are, are required within within the building and so on. Um, sorry, on M4 there on the previous slide, it relates to works in connection with exten uh, extensions and material alterations of existing dwellings. Okay, so that's just the uh, uh, M4 there. So the when the when part M uh, 2010 was 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 uh, launched in the statutory instrument, they also put, uh, uh, published uh, the Department of Environment. Sorry, also published the. Uh, TGD or Technical Guidance Document M. It's, breaking, it's broken into four parts. Uh, part M, the requirement. Section 1, which is access and use of buildings other, uh, buildings other than dwellings. Section 2, which is access and use of existing buildings other than dwellings. And Section 3, which, which is access and use of, 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 of dwellings. So Section 3 relates to the dwellings. Section 1 and 2 relate to buildings other than dwellings. Uh, and I suppose just a, a common misconception made out there is that if you're doing work on an existing building, you can go to section two and use that as the guidance to 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 make the building comply with part M of the building regulations. However, it doesn't matter if the building is a new or an existing building. You must first go. So if it's a new building, you always have to go to section one of TGDM. However, if it's an existing building, you must first go to section one uh, and try and apply the guidance in section one for an existing building. However, it may not be practicable in all situations to achieve the guidance in section one, and then you would apply the guidance in section two. So I suppose just to just as was to a common misconception made by some some designers is that it's an existing building will automatically go to section two of the guide and try to apply that but i suppose remember the concept of practicability needs to kick in there as well the other thing i suppose and we, we may not quit, we won't have time to go into the, into this today but uh, in the technical guidance document in the introduction it says that tgdm 2010 may not always be the most appropriate document to use when you're working on protected structures so there's a number of codes of practices and there's a number of um, guidelines. For example, the Department of Environment would, uh, published a, a, an access guide back in 2012 on making heritage buildings accessible for people with disabilities. Um, so that, that's covered in section 08 of the, of the technical guidance document. 
So as I, as I mentioned there, the, there's four, four parts to TGDM. Uh, the first part is part M, the requirement. It's approximately 15 pages long. And it gives you, it sets out how to apply a technical guidance document M for different types of works. So it always highlights at, at, at sessions that 0 0.6 is quite an important uh, uh, part of TGDM because it tells you how to apply part M, whether you're, whether, you're, whether you're working on a new building, an extension, a material alteration or material change of use. And there's different ways of applying part M depending on the types of works that you're doing. So the material alteration will, will be slightly different from a material change of use and so on. So that is isn't quite an important page. Page 11, it goes from 068 to 060. It's well worth having a look at it. The section 07 is the determination of practicability. And that's where you're working on an existing building and you may run into structural issues or you may run into uh, planning issues in relation to trying to build, bring an, an existing building in line with TGM 2010. Um, in relation to fire safety, um, it states that in TGDM that part M, or sorry, that, that the requirements of part M relate to access and use of a building, but they must be, but buildings must be designed, and I suppose accessibility must be done in in um, in line with with part B of the requirements as well in relation to fire safety. Okay, and then section 012 relates to management. It basically says that although management doesn't form part of the building regulations it is quite important and it, it can be used as a comp compensatory measure to make buildings accessible. So there is a section on management there as well. Um, for those of you who are doing a lot of work on existing buildings, section 0 0.8 is also important because it tells you again how to apply part M for an existing building. It tells you as well that if you are working on the protected structures that you should be liaising with the, conserva the conservation officer uh, in advance of preparing a DAC application. And again, it gives you guidance on what other guides are available to, to make a build, uh, the building um, accessible. So the, 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 the TGDM then is uh, section one, section one of, of the technical guidance document is broken into six parts. And if you kind of look at the way that the table is laid out there, it's like a journey that people may be taking. They first need to approach the building. So they approach the building via car or, or pedestrian. Access to the building relates to the entrances, 1.2. 1.3 is circulating around the building, so it's everything from lifts to stairwells and so on. 1.4 is sanitary <coughs> facilities, so it's allowing people to use the various uh, toilet facilities within a building. 1.5 is other facilities within the building, like the, the room we're in here. Uh, comp, uh, audience and spectator facilities with, seat, with fixed seating, tea stations, design of, of, of bedrooms in hotels or in student accommodation and things like that. And then finally, we have 1.6, which is AIDS communication. So just quickly, if we if we run through them, 1.1 uh, covers everything from car parking to hazards on, on approaches to buildings. So for example, maintaining a clear headroom of 2.1 meters on approach. Uh, it covers things like level access routes, ramped access routes, sloped access routes, um, and stepped access routes. It goes into things like the lighting levels on a, on in a car parking bay need to be um, 20, 20 lux, 20 lux, yeah. Uh, and the lighting at steps and ramps need to be 100 lux and, and, and so on. So there's a, there's a lot of guidance there in, in, in section 1.1 without going into the detail. Everything from car parking to set down areas to, to ramps and, and, and steps. 1.2 covers the entrances to the buildings uh, to buildings and includes everything from automated doors, manually operated doors, effective clear widths of doors has, has changed from the old guidance and things like that. Outward opening doors that are power assisted need to have barriers and and so on, glazed manifestations, uh, design of your entrance lobbies, thresholds, and, and things like that. 1.3 covers circulation within the building, um, everything from the design of your corridors uh, to design of stairwells, lifts. Um, one of the key changes in the, in, the new, in, the, in the new guidance, as we call it, is that even if you have a lift in the building, at least one of your stairwells needs to be Part M compliant. Uh, so you, need, you always have to have at least one Part M ambulance disabled stairwell uh, within the building. It calls out the design of lifts. It, it gives some quirks in relation to larger buildings that like shopping centers and cinemas and so on, where they have to have larger lifts and things like that. Sanitary facilities. There's been a lot of different changes in relation to sanitary facilities. And I'll give some examples as, as I go through the, the, some of the slides and photographs in, 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 in a few minutes. Um, so in relation to 1.4, it covers everything from the design of unisex accessible WCs. And I suppose the key thing there to remember is that they must be unisex accessible because you must remember that a mother, a mother could arrive at a building with her son. Her son may need assistance. So 
it's really mm -hmm. important that, that it's unisex so that the, mom, the, that the mom can go in and actually provide assistance to the son and so on. So the provision of toilets, it, but it also covers the design of the male and female toilets, including things like ambulance saber cubicles, enlarged cubicles, ambulance urinals and, and, and things like that. Other, uh, other facilities then within buildings, everything from the design of your tea stations, bars and restaurants, so for example counters in, in a new bar or in a new restaurant, they must uh, provide a low section uh, that's suitable for wheelchair access. If you have audience and spectator facilities, you must provide a choice of location for a wheelchair user, but you also must provide hearing enhancement systems for people who have uh, hearing impairments uh, and, and so on. And finally, aids to communication. I suppose it's everything from your, your signage, which I have a few examples here, and I think it's something we, we'll come to talk about later on, is, is how, do you, how do you actually design your directional signage to ensure that it is accessible, uh, which is an area that there may be need, need for more guidance uh, in relation to embossed lettering and, and do you need braille and do you, do you, what kind of co visual contrast do you need to provide in your, in your signage and things like that. But we'll, we'll talk about that as a, 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 in a few minutes. So AIDS communication covers four, four areas, lighting, signage, visual contrast, uh, and hearing enhancement systems. And you can see on the image there, I'm just giving you an example of, of a, a hearing induction loop at a reception area. So that's one of the key requirements now that you must provide a hearing induction loop uh, at, at, a, at the main reception in the main foyer of a new building. Um, and how that works is that it's, um, there will be a microphone sitting on the desk uh, the person will, has a hearing aid, they walk up to the desk, they see the sign to indicate that there's a hearing induction loop, they turn their, their hearing aid to the T frequency, and what happens then is that the, the microphone picks up what the lady is saying behind the reception, and it amplifies the sound into the person's hearing aid. And as someone with a hearing impairment said to me recently, it's like the sound is amplified right into the middle of their head. So it's just a piece of assistive technology to, to assist people with, with, with low hearing. Um, your lighting and your visual contrast, Again, to remember that your, your visual contrast is me measured through what's known as light reflectant values, uh, or LRVs, and there's a scale of 0 to 100. You, it, you know, there's, there's different scales. For example, the, the, a door handle on a door needs to provide 15 points different on the LRV scale, whereas uh, the floors and walls in, in a bathroom may need to have 20 points in the scale and so on. And some, there's some instances where you need to have a 30-point LRV scale uh, difference in colors as well uh, between ele elements within the building. Um, not going to go into too much on the BCAR, but you're, you're all aware that back in 2013, the, the government launched SIA 80 of 2013, and I suppose you can see here the main aims of the, of the building control amendment regulations at the time were to introduce certificates of compliance by a design certifier at designs at commencement stage uh, to, to ensure that a number of inspections would be carried out during construction on all of the building regulations going from part A to part M. Uh, that there would be a certificate of compliance by an assigned certifier uh, on completion of a project, but there would also be a certificate of compliance on completion by a builder uh, on completion as well. So, you know, you, you're familiar about with the with the building control amendment regulations. You've probably all been working on projects where where you where you've been either an assigned certifier or, or an ancillary certifier. Um, but you know, you need to have your certificates at commencement. You need to carry out your number of inspections throughout the process. And then you need to sign off uh, uh, on completion and so on. You 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 may be aware that there was a genuine error in the text in the in the 2013 regulations, and they were replaced by SI number nine of uh, 2014 in February 2014. So again, the SI came out in 2000 in February 2004, but the actual BCAR regulations came into operation from the 1st of March uh, 2014. So there was a lot of activity to get commencement notices in before the before the uh, 1st of March, but things, I suppose, a lot of, all the new projects that are being rolled out now need to implement the BCAR. Um, it applies to buildings and works that require fire safety sorts, new dwellings, houses, and apartments, and extensions to dwelling which are greater than 40 square meters. Um, as I said, the, the, the building control regulations, they introduce mandatory certification, uh, they, they allow for lodging, of, you have to lodge your, your plans and other particulars as part of your, your commencement notice. Uh, they introduce the mandatory inspections and also, I suppose, the validation and registration process uh, to, towards the completion of, of, of the project. Um, that's just kind of repeating some of the stuff we, we've, we, we've covered, but um, <coughs> you have to have your, your, your you know, you have your, your design certifier, who, who's mainly, in most instances, in the bigger projects, it's going to be your, your architect. You have your assigned certifier, 
who may be an independent third party or in some situations the design teams would be would be taking on the role as a sign certifier as well and then the, i suppose there's more more onus on the builder to actually um uh, to, to, to 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 comply with the requirements of the of the building controller regulations as well and there's they have to sign off uh, on completion so you can see there there's a, a, design, a design certificate signed by the design certifier at commencement stage a form of undertaking taken by the, the assigned certifier at commencement stage there's also a form of undertaking signed by the builder at commencement stage and then finally there's a certificate on completion by the builder and design certifier on completion stage and as everyone probably knows in the room today there's also the ancillary certifier who could be your your m e consultant it could be your fire consultant or it could be your 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 access consultant and so on who are taking on responsibility for implementation of their own uh, areas of, of, of expertise um, and i suppose this slide is just really highlighting that there is a number of key players that come that are involved in, in the process including the building owner the design certifier the design certifier the builder the ancillary certifier and the building control authority and there is a code of practice um, and if you go into the code of practice it outlines the key responsibilities for all those key players uh, as part of implementing the the building control uh, regulations so i i suppose Sorry, where was that? Who publishes the code of practice? Uh, the Department of Environment. Yeah. So um, that's available on the environment.ie uh, website. Uh, so I suppose really what I just want to try and do now is just kind of give you a quick overview of where accessibility can go wrong. Um, and it can go wrong at a number of uh, stages during the process, but it can also go wrong from, I suppose, from very minor issues to very major issues. Um, so what we what we'd say is if you I look at the the, the the chart here, it can go wrong at the very at the project initiation stage, which may not be anything to do with building control or building control regulations, but it still can go wrong there. It can go wrong at the planning stage, the design stage, the detailed design stage. During construction, it can majorly go wrong, and that handover can also go wrong. Um, so let's kind of go through it. Um, one of the things you'll find is that if the client doesn't understand about accessibility or is, a, is unaware of the Equal Status Act or the Disability Act or other pieces of legislation that they need to comply with in relation to making the building accessible or the services in that building accessible, then you're kind of starting from a very low uh, entry point in relation to accessibility. So I suppose just to, to bear in mind that all the public bodies in Ireland, so the government departments, the local authorities and the, the agencies under those government departments like the the, the National Disability Authority, the, the, the previous National Roads Authority and uh, the Irish Blood Transfusion Services and so on, they have to comply with the Disability Act. And in the Disability Act, it's, it tells them that they must write accessibility into the procurement process for all of their new buildings, their, their, if, they're, if they're procuring websites, if they're getting contractors in to do work and things like that. So not, not only do they need to comply with the building control regulations, they also need to comply with the Disability Act. So they have a, actually a higher level of, of of uh, requirements that they need to comply with and they should be trying to ensure that accessibility is embedded within within with all, within all their tendering exercises so a recent example we came across on on the e-tenders for for a public body was tendering for for some major projects and they had a, a two lines in it and it said something like in relation to accessibility all it said was the building must be designed to meet the needs of people with physical and, and sensory impairments. And that was the only thing in the brief in relation to accessibility, apart from compliance with building regulations. So I suppose really what we're saying here, from a client's perspective, it can all go wrong if they're not, if, they're, if, they, if they don't have a, an understanding about what is accessibility. If they're just thinking about the 1% of the wheelchairs rather than the 40% of people that we've mentioned uh, uh, previously. Um, so that's just the, the, the project initiation. A planning, and I think, more and more of the projects that we're being involved in were, I suppose, we're being involved from the very outset and we're getting more involved in, in, in planning reviews and things like that. Whereas before we may have done one review at planning stage, now we could be doing four or five reviews in relation to uh, uh, accessibility. But I suppose it can all go wrong at the planning stage. Um, and I just use the example here of Diagram 8 from TGDM. And you can see in Diagram 8, uh, you have an accessible car parking bay it's got a hatched area around both sides of the bay and at the rear. That hatched area is, is, is a transfer space for, for the wheelchair user so they can open their door fully, get out of their car easily and, and get up onto a footpath. So they want to be able to get out of their car in this position here and go straight up onto a footpath, which is a safe access route leading to the building. 
um, rather than having to go backwards and go behind the load, loads of cars here, which could be, they're so low down, it could be a health and safety issue and so on. So these are three recent examples. This was an example from yesterday of a project we were working on. And these are, are other examples which we've come across recently. So the visitor car parking, at least 5% of visitor car parking bays need to be accessible, but the design team didn't even, there, there was no consideration of accessibility in that example. The second example is where they, it was a school and basically they, they had thought about accessibility, so they had put the hatched area at the side of the bay, but they didn't consider the transfer area at the back, which is important again for, for people who might be coming with, with boot access in their car and things like that. So you need to make sure your bay is six meters long. And um, the third example there is where the, fo the footpath was provided at the head of the bay, but it was too narrow. It was only 1200 millimeters wide. So again, remember you're going to have drop curbs and things like that there as well. So you need to make the footpaths slightly wider uh, in that instances. Other thing that's coming up in relation to planning and, and car parking is the, to maintain a clear headroom of 2.6 meters in, in basement car parks. And um, so that's just something to look at. That is written into TGDM. There is an alternative where you provide signage to indicate alternative accessible bays at ground floor level, but just keep an eye on that one in relation to the design of basement car parks uh, and maintaining 2.6 meters uh, clear headroom. So what's, why, why that particular uh, It's to allow for some cars will have the they'll either have they may have the wheelchair in the in the roof rack or alternatively they may have high top uh, vehicles where the wheelchair user can drive straight in at the back. So it's to allow for that space. Yeah. Is that too low? Uh, it's to, it's it's from the actual access ramp down into the into to location of where the accessible bays are. So it's only and you have to make sure it's on the ramp down as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, second example and again and just uh, a lot of a lot of examples were coming up with uh, recently in relation to sloped access routes. So a sloped access route is where the gradient is is between one and twenty and one is to fifty. So it's a sloped access route. But anywhere you provide a sloped access route, you have to provide a level landing for every 500 millimeters of the rise. So this example was, uh, there's two levels, you can't read them there, but level here, and there's a level at that point. I think the slope was about one is to 21, but the change level was 790 millimeters. So you should have had a half landing there, which was, was a level landing for, uh, you know, halfway, I suppose, in that instance. But for every 500 millimeter rise, you have to provide a level landing. So again, just keep an eye on that for, some of the um, and some of the on on the, on the, the approach routes within the site. Uh, an example here of an external set of steps, but the landing there didn't comply with with or the, the the door or the gate into it didn't comply with the parquet of the building regulations. And here's an example of an uncontrolled crossing. So you've got your raised uh, crossing point, but they they put this they, there's no need to provide the stem, which is this area here at the back of the actual crossing point. If it's uncontrolled crossing, so uncontrolled crossings are usually yellow uh, or buff color, whereas controlled crossings are red, and the red one always has a stem. So if it's an uncontrolled crossing, there's no need to have this have the stem there. And I just use this example here of, excuse me, where you're going to you're, where you're going to be providing uh, car dry tactile warnings at the top and bottom of your external steps, which is these guys here. And um, just remember, if you're setting out your steps. Oh, Sorry, make sure that you have sufficient space to provide the tactile warnings clear of, a, of approach routes and so on. So you don't want them to become a barrier for people with mobility impairments and so on. So moving on then, I suppose in, in detailed design, it can all go wrong. And I just use this example and say, look, surely there's not too much that can go wrong here in relation to accessibility. It's a simple little reception area with a, with a stairs and, a, and, and some toilets. So you think it would be relatively straightforward. But I suppose the first thing to note is that if you have a revolving door, you must provide a complementary uh, accessible door for, for people who may use a, who may have assistance dogs or guide dogs or people who might um, uh, be using wheelchairs and things like that. So remember, revolving doors are not accessible for people with reduced mobility. The second example is, you know, you must provide a part-time stairwell within the building um, and the max rise between landings would be 1.8 meters. So that would need to be checked there. Um, where you have a block of toilets, if you have two, so say for example, that's the male toilet area. If you have two cubicles like that, one needs to be a standard uh, cubicle and one needs to be an ambulant cubicle with an outward opening door fitted with grab rails and things like that. Um, also, if you provide toilet facilities at a location, everywhere you provide a block of toilets, so a block of male and female toilets, you must provide at least one unisex accessible toilet at that location as well. Um, we don't have any information on the design of the reception area, so we might go back to the client and ask them, 
you know, how, how, how do we ensure that the reception area is accessible? And also we need to consider the effective clear widths of doors. So where the door doesn't open beyond 90 degrees, like in, that, in this instance here, the effective clear width of that door needs to take into account the door handle. Um, and again, that's something that people need to watch out for, especially in office buildings or in schools where doors are opening directly onto walls. They need to consider uh, the effective clear width. In relation to circulation, uh, a number of instances there, um, I suppose one of the key ones is where you have doors opening out onto corridors, they need to be recessed. So if you have your if you're designing your accessible toilets and they're going to be off the main corridor, the door itself needs to be recessed. It can't open directly out onto a corridor like that. So if you read the text here, it says 900 millimeter clear space, space sorry, where the door to an accessible WC opens into an infrequently used corridor, which is not an escape route. So most corridors are going to be, and in fact, nearly all corridors will be on, on, on escape routes. So uh, that's something just to consider there. And again, I'd say in the last 10 applications we've had DAC applications, most of them will have doors opening directly out onto corridors. So here, there's an example of, of an office opening out onto a corridor. Um, there's an example, I suppose, of making sure that, oh, sorry, sorry, sensitive. Um, an example of if you have a, a corridor and the corridor is only 1,200 wide, you need to provide turning areas, which is the example here. Uh, you need to provide turning areas at key junctions at, at, at the end of the corridors and things like that. Uh, in relation to toilets, again, you, you, the new technical guidance document, or TGDM 2010, requires that the accessible toilet door opens out. And the main reason it opens out is that if you can visualize a wheelchair user driving into that toilet there, uh, they can turn around in, in the, in the, within the toilet and they can pull the door behind them to close it. Whereas in the old guidance, the toilet door opened in, which meant it was very difficult to get, a, get past the door, turn around and try and close that door out. So doors must open out. Um, but there's an example where you're going to have an outward opening door, but it's opening directly out into a, 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 a 1200 millimeter wide corridor. So that's not going to be allowed there. Also, you have the layout here doesn't match the requirements of, of, of TGM 2010, which I'll talk about in a second. Second example, you have a, your bank of male and female toilets. You don't have any ambulance disabled cubicles. Uh, here you need to have, where you have four or more cubicles, you have to have an enlarged cubicle. Um, and also you need to consider the design of your 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 urinals and things like that. Um, and there, the design of that toilet, if the door does open in, it needs to have the 1800 turning area with inside clear of the door swing. So that's just an, uh, another example there. I'll skip over that one. Um, other areas where it can go wrong in the design stage, um, the, the, this was uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a third level institute where they were putting in a conference room, but they weren't considering space for wheelchair users. So you need to provide a choice of locations for the wheelchair user to, to sit in that area. You need to provide paired seating where two wheelchair users can sit next to each other, but also seating where a wheelchair user can sit next to their companion who may be able-bodied and so on. Uh, bleacher seating, ensuring that you provide a choice of location again for, for people uh, using wheelchairs. Tea stations comes up quite a lot. If you're designing your tea stations, you must provide access in underneath the sink for, for wheelchair users, but also you must provide a low section of the counter that is that is accessible and so on. And third area then is a uh, student accommodation uh, or, or hotel bedrooms. Um, and key things to note there, there is a diagram in TGDM that tells you that on one side of the bed you need to have 700 millimeters of space and on the other side of the bed you need to have 1800 turning area to allow a wheelchair user to turn around and things like that. So I suppose what's happening in a lot of uh, developments at the moment is they're trying to squeeze as many bedrooms as they can into the development which means that they're not considering the sizes of the rooms for to make sure that they're fully accessible for the wheelchair user. And you can kind of see here even that the shape of the accessible toilet doesn't really facilitate good access for people with reduced mobility. Um, during construction, so I've just given some photographs during construction, and I'll just quickly run through some of them. Here, for example, the handrail is running down at 45 degrees, and it doesn't extend 300 millimeters beyond the flight. Uh, so that's a, a, a poor example there. The accessible car parking bay, sorry, it's not my computer here. The accessible car parking bay has to be on a level surface. Um, and you can see there, there's quite a bit, bit of a crossfall there. Remember, some wheelchairs may not have brakes. What is good about this example here is that they've used a change of color uh, on the flight of the ramp. Uh, so they've used color contrast to, to, to assist people with visual impairments to differentiate the, 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 the change of color. Uh, here is an example of, um, this is where we were, we did a DSE for, for this project, 
and we went along to inspect afterwards and that's where the accessible car parking bays were supposed to be but that's what was uh, faced in front of us here's another example of a, a, an entrance to a building fully glazed panels needs to have the glazed manifestation at dual heights and the glazed manifestations need to contrast visually and there's another example of a, of, of a, a project where we had a DAC application um, went to inspect afterwards and it was a 75 mil step at the entrance where they said there was going to be level access and a level threshold as well and so on. Um, sorry, some of those ones are the same entrances, but in relation to that to this entrance here, um, if you have if you have a wide set of, of glazed panels like that, so if you have a fully an entrance which is fully glazed, uh, the door itself needs to provide good visual contrast. So in that image there, you'd need to provide some sort of uh, edge markings around the glass. To allow people to differentiate where the entrance is, um, and that's written into technical guidance document them as well. So remember to we'll try and attract people with visual impairments towards the entrance and uh, and so on there. Um, again, some other examples. The the guy on the top left is a a, a, st a new stairwell that was that was in the DAC application that was uh, put down as a part M fully compliant uh, stairwell, but there was no visual contrasting nosings on 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 the stairs and so on. Um, the example below is in a protected structure where you have a, that's the door leading to the accessible toilet, but the wall, the door was 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 set in in 500 millimeter thick walls. So if you can actually, the wheelchair user won't be able to get close enough to the door handle to actually get into that um um that entrance there. So it's going to be very difficult for someone to get in. A uh, second example was the door. Doors need doors and circulation will need to provide adequate visual contrast. That was going to be a white door on a white wall, so there was going to be no visual contrast. Um, the example here on the bottom right is where you don't have visual contrast nosings on all of the steps, whereas you should have. Um, and the example on the top right, the handrail must extend 300 millimeters beyond the top and bottom of the flight, and that's that's quite important there for people with reduced mobility, so they can actually reach forward and, and pull themselves up steps or or handrails and so on. Um, so again, some of the stuff there is, is similar enough. You've got I suppose here you've got lack of visual contrast. So remember, floors, walls, the end of the corridor, the doors need to provide good visual contrast. Here you've got open risers. Open risers should be avoided on stairwells. People get their feet caught on underneath the stairs and so on. Here again in a protected structure where there's there's no visual contrasting on the nosings, but also the handrails that were provided, they should be round in profile, about 50 millimeters thick, because that allows people to grip them quite easily. Whereas those ones were, I think they were about 100 mil in diameter. So it's going to be very hard for different people to actually grip the, the handrails in those instances. Uh, something that's coming up quite a lot is the vision panels, um, or sorry, the glazed manifestations on on, 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 on on glazed screens and so on. In the technical guidance document, it says that there must be 30 points difference in the color between the glazed manifestations and the, and the background. So a lot of the instances there, people are putting just the etching on the glass. And I don't think that provides the 30 points difference in, 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 in color there as well. And those two examples are where you have a ramp that's leading directly to a door and there isn't sufficient landing spaces uh, and, and so on. Um, th that's not a bad example of a lift. It's got good, it's got well-designed buttons, which are quite big. Uh, it's got embossed, or sorry, the buttons themselves provide visual contrast. It's fitting, fitted with a hearing induction coupler or, your, or a hearing induction loop to assist people with hearing impairments if, if there's an emergency. It's got visual contrasting um, grab rails, but remember the, the floor on the lift needs to be a light color. And the main reason it needs to be a light color is that it, for someone with vision impairment, they don't want the illusion of stepping into an empty lift shaft. So dark colors should be avoided on, on the floor of a lift, light colors where, where possible. Toilets, it's where it all goes wrong. I think people are gonna end up calling us Mr. Toilets, uh, toilet consultants, because half the problems relate to toilets in relation to uh, uh, accessibility and these are just some examples there uh, the one in the top in the middle if you're providing your toilet uh, if it's going to be an accessible WC and shower area the, the sink is going to be a larger type sink so the, there needs to be a 200 millimeter recess on the wall the other thing is that on the diagram on TGDM on the diagram 21 it looks like the toilet is 2.5 by 2.5 meters but in fact if you look at the measurements it should be 2.7 by 2.5 with the 200 millimeter recess um, and that's catching a lot of people out there in relation to the design of your WCs and shower areas. Um, there for example that was a supposed to be a part M compliant accessible shower area there was no grab rails there was no alarms 
and the fixtures and fittings were were incorrectly located. But how is the person with, in the wheelchair going to actually get the shower head down in 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 that instance there? Okay, um, the the example on the right is a is an ambulance disabled cubicle. But remember, you must provide a a pull handle on the door as well. You must provide coat hooks. And remember things like shelves for shelves for people using philosophy bags as well is quite important uh, if you have a recessed cistern and so on. So that's just something to, to watch out for. Um, in the example on the left, the alarm is incorrectly located. So the alarm is over here on the right hand side of the image. It should be located between the toilet here and, and the wall. So somewhere in that position there. And you should be able to push the reset while sitting on the toilet. So if you've accidentally pulled the alarm, you're sitting on the toilet, you should be able to put the push the reset button and so on. There's an example showing, I suppose, good practice with good visual contrast between the floors and the walls, a uh, good contrast between the seat cover, for example, and 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 the to and toilet. And what they've done in that instance there is they put the alarm cord right, they put the alarm cord right around the actual perimeter of the room. So no matter where you fall on the ground, you can pull the pull the cord there. Um, again, things like tea stations must provide knee recess underneath the sinks. That's an example of an accessible bedroom, but there's not there's insufficient space to circulate around the bed. And to allow someone to transfer onto the bed. Here's a new bar uh, bar counter. It needs to provide a, a low um, a low level access. And again, typical uh, accessible uh, WC and shower room in a hotel. It needs to provide adequate visual contrast. Again, remember, there's lots of good designs out there. Or there's lots of good products that you can buy that that are that, that have quite good aesthetics as well. Uh, so it doesn't have to look like the the medical model or, or the the hospital uh, toilet and so on. There's an example of signage. And I'm not sure if you can see clearly on the image on the right, but there's two steps on, on the image there on the right. So the idea here is that you have the sign, it's similar to this sign, you have a, a embossed lettering and you have braille on it. And the whole idea then is that someone with a vision impairment can get up, up close to the sign. They can run their eyes along the sign or they can run their fingers along the sign and things like that. But no one's going to be able to balance on two steps while reading braille and a, a tactile sign. So the importance of, of the location of the sign but equally important is, is the design of the sign. So, for example, a white sign uh, should be on a dark background, whereas what you should have there, if you have a white wall, you should have a dark background for the sign. So, for example, if you put that sign up on the wall there, it's going to provide good visual contrast. Remember, 80% of people with vision impairments have residual vision. They can pick out various objects and things like that. Um, so I'm just going to keep going. Visual contrast then, uh, you know, I've given some examples there already. The... You've got the toilet, you've got the, the nosings on the steps. Remember, it's measured through light reflectance values. You need to consider your lighting levels within your buildings. For example, in corridors, 100 lux. In your accessible toilets, they need to be two to 300 lux and so on. And then it can also go wrong at handover. And really what I'm saying here is that the organization here has taken a lot of time to get their signage right. They've used good colors. For example, all their floors are, are, are color coded and things like that. They have embossed lettering. They have used symbols and things like that. You can see that they've good signage in front of the lift number level one, but they've put a table right in front of the signage, which means that someone can't actually get up close to it and and and, and read it and so on. So it can go wrong at handover. Other example would be your hearing enhancement systems. They need to be tested. Your hearing duct loops. They need to be tested on a regular basis. So we'd always say to people, look, your manuals or your hand, your building manuals or your hand at handover. They need to consider some sort of checklist for for accessibility um, as well. Number of resources out there. We've got TGDM, Technical Guidance Document M. If you're looking at the design of pedestrian crossings, you need to be aware of the guide in the middle, which is the Good Practice Guidelines and Accessibility Streetscapes. And then you've, you've got numerous uh, references to the British Standard BS 8300 within the Technical Guidance Document, so you need to be aware of that. Um, you also have along the bottom there a Good Practice Guideline produced by the National Disability Authority next door, uh, which is Building for Everyone. That's the national guideline, I suppose, national good practice guideline on accessibility and universal design for buildings. It's broken into nine different booklets. They also produced guidelines on access auditing of buildings. Um, and there's a number of codes of practice then produced uh, under the Disability Act uh, as well. I suppose just to conclude quickly, I'm just conscious of the time here. Um, part M. I suppose really it's about access for all people, not just people with disabilities. So all people regardless of their age, their size or their disability. So even though the technical guidance document focuses very much on, on still on disability access, remember there's a broader scope that you may need to be uh, uh, meeting the requirements for. Um, the second thing, accessibility and compliance with Part M, it needs to be considered at all stages of projects. 
not just the design stage, throughout the construction and so on. And I suppose what we're finding more and more is that accessibility needs to be linked with all the different disciplines, whether it's the landscape architect, whether it's the fire consultant, the M&E who's specifying the lift uh, or the lighting levels, the contractors who are actually fitting out the toilets and, and the, the floor finishes and things like that, the suppliers, for example, your signage suppliers, so they know exactly how to comply with part them in relation to signage design, and then your conservation architects if you're working on protected structures. There are also a number of areas where the guidance is lacking, I would think, in, as in where people need, like for example, in relation to signage, there is only about three or four paragraphs in TGDM on the design of signs, but it, it's very hard to get any more information on how exactly to design your signage correctly. Other areas, things like exits, fire exits coming out of buildings, what levels of accessibility need to be required. I refer you back to page 18 of, of, of TGDM, which says that all approach routes from, from buildings need to be accessible and page 38 which says all fire exits need to be accessible as well so have a have a think about that if you have stepped access from your fire exits and so on and i suppose the the last point has the building control amendment regulations resulted in better accessibility i suppose only time will will, will tell but i think it's it's making a difference definitely all right so thanks very much for your time and I, i'll open it up to any questions people may have Just before uh, any questions, has everybody got a copy of the, the notes, the, the slides? If anybody wants them, they're, they're, these are down here. Anyway. Thanks. Actually, I'll show you. Maybe we should leave them at the door. <laughs> Make more sense. Any questions, anybody? In terms of decar and signing off and sorry certificates, um, like uh, I've gone out to buildings. Uh, to do inspections and found issues, which I think will always find issues if you go to a building and use TGDM. And so, how how strenuous are you in implementing to the letter TGDM and uh, signing off your solution for the part of the I suppose the big thing we're finding is that the accessibility consultant or the person who's looking after accessibility probably needs to. Be a lot more involved than they actually are in the, in, in the process because I suppose it, 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 from an accessibility point of view it all goes wrong towards the end so the last two weeks when everyone is trying to get everything done is where the shortcuts are going to be taken in relation to accessibility so it can go wrong there of the of the sites that we've been involved in or of the projects we've been involved in I suppose some of them have been small some of them have been quite are, are quite big in, in the process at the moment but a lot of the ones that we've done, the ancillary certifier for at the moment, they've been, I suppose they haven't been relatively small, but some of them have been quite small and we have adopted the TGDM by the letter of the law. So for example, if the stairwell didn't have the 300 extension, we went back and made sure it did have it. If there was an issue in one project where the, where the actual, the rises of the steps were, 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 the bottom step was inconsistent with all the other steps and you had to go and modify it and things like that. But I think, you could be spending two weeks there if you want to get it 100 percent right in relation to part m possibly I'm not sure if i'm answering that question right well, or not like, is there any room for maneuvering like for example with parking fire safety yeah well, I, certain elements to go. technical guidance document m is a guide and exactly. it's the minimum guide to show compliance with part m that's what the department of environment will say in relation to meeting part m yeah it's not the only guide to to to, to use to meet the requirements of part m and remember, at the end of the day, you're signing off on the requirements, which is, has adequate provision been provided to allow people to access new the building facilities and environs? So again, it, I, it, it could be a bit too early to answer that question, you know? I'm not trying to fudge it, but... Yeah, but uh, I suppose things like, like bathrooms, accessible bathrooms, and all the dimensions that are in the diagrams, the yeah. and all the diagrams in the TGD. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't give a uh, TGM doesn't give tolerances for plus or minus twenty an hour to an hour. It's just dimensions in there. So Yeah, well I would say in relation to the TGDM diagrams, I think their minimum sizes, for example, the the, the one point eight metre wide or the one point five metre wide. Uh, but I think there is scope to adjust the layout slightly in relation to door swings and stuff, for example. Mm -hmm. If you go to the British standard BSA thousand three hundred it gives you an alternative option of having an outward opening door on the longer wall, whereas TGDM only gives you one option, which is on the shorter wall. So there are there are variations that you can adopt. The other thing is, I suppose, in relation to that is 
you want to make sure that you're maintaining the 1800 turning area within the actual toilet or, or some toilets are going to have 1500 turning areas and so on so once you can show that you've maintained that there will be situations where you're not going to have it exactly the way it is in, in the technical guidance document and I suppose the other way of looking at it is like for example in, in relation to the design I, I know I'm harking back onto signage and stuff like there's a specific specific guide to design a toilet but there's no specific guide to actually say you, how to design your signage so how do we determine if our signage is fully accessible to meet the requirements of part M of the building regulations so where's the guide for that I suppose to throw, the, throw it the opposite way like you know and you mentioned there um, the, the, the tea stations or fans that you were talking about access to the, the sinks. Yeah. And so the height of the top of the sink, I can't remember. It's, it's I, I don't have it off hand. It's like 850, yeah. yeah. And then it says you have to have a 700 mil recess below to get the knees yeah. to the wheelchair. So that's leaving you with a very, very shallow sink. Well, there's issues in relation, I think, even counter heights in that. Yeah. Fridges are designed to fit in underneath a 900 mil high counter, and if you're saying 850, it leads to issues in relation to counter heights and stuff. Mm -hmm. But I suppose the thing is, you need to design a section of your working counter that is fully accessible for a wheelchair user, but also to allow the 1800 turning area in front of that counter to allow the wheelchair user to turn around and go back in the opposite direction. But you're saying you're saying the, the issue is what I'm talking about here with the 850 and the sink of the 850. I yeah, I suppose there are like I can I can provide you with examples of where it's been done and what what measurements and what specifications they've used if you want afterwards and we can. Is, it, is that alright? Yeah. Sorry. The fact that the accessibility engineer or advisor, whichever you want, isn't actually seen as an insurance certifier at an early enough stage in the project. There's no point in getting to. To the end product, which I know we've got a problem here with corridor width and everything. Well, I suppose they are in that, like you have to apply for your disability access cert as well. So, you know, in the bigger in the in the projects, they're going to have a disability access cert. So the access consultant or the fire consultant or whoever's doing the, the DAC will be involved from very on from the very outset. But I suppose there's a lot that can go wrong during construction, even if you have a draw a draw a, a DAC that says the corridors are going to be 1200 wide or there's so much changes that happen throughout the process or things that happen on site that cause things to change like even the like r recent example last week of the contractors laying the tactile paving at the crossing points in the school and the subcontractor just went in and put down the tactile paving whichever way he felt was the right way so they end up going back and taking it all out and, and putting in the correct layouts and stripping back some of the they had they had made it like 2.5 meters deep where it should have been only 1200 millimeters deep and stuff like that so i suppose it it's, goes to the experience of the contractor as well and the the experience of the subcontractors that are actually fitting the fitting out the building or putting the even things like fixing handrails so typical example of the one of the very first the uh, uh, ancillary certifier jobs we did where they were fitting out a, a, a wc in shower room and the the plumber put the sink in the wrong location and measured everything from that sink so he put the grab rails up he put the the, mm. the soap dispenser the reset everything based on the sink and they had to go back and when we went in to inspect we said look the sink is in the wrong location and as a result everything is wrong so and the main problem was that they didn't actually read the drawings like yeah but then surely the way to address that problem is to make sure that you that you're declared as an incendiary certifier right at the very start of the project because then you've got by virtue of being part of the design team and answerable to the design certifier yeah. then you're going to be in a position to generate sensory certificates for design inspection and construction and in theory and we're going to all fly in theory in a minute by the time you get to the end of construction you will have a, a proper access to site to make sure that these taken and picked up at of course the end of the process yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you're engaged at the start of the process. Yeah, well, and that, and that is true. And I suppose that happens with uh, any of the projects we are working as an ancillary certifier. That, that's what happens. But I suppose the reality is so we have a, a small job, uh, one floor of of a healthcare facility at the moment. And they're going, they have a DSE, they're going for an ancillary certifier. We've already done, we've been involved throughout the process. We've specified all the signage. We've specified that we've reviewed all the, the, the detailed drawings for toilets and all that. But it's not on we're on a third inspection now so we're going out for a third inspection tomorrow but we haven't been able to actually assess anything 
in the first two because it was too early in the process for for accessibility. But I don't know what I'm going to face tomorrow when I go because they, you know. So it's it's a lot of the stuff from accessibility, like whether it's installing a grab rail to the the, the finishes on the floor or the colors colors on the walls. It's kind of that happens at the very end of the process. Oh, I'm sorry, that's lovely lad, but as a colour contrast, how do you deal with that? Because you lab it on the site near the end and it's only then that the colours of the walls are going on at the floor, finishes are going down, and the door finishes handles. The contrast, how do you deal with contrast, the etching on the glass, would you say compared to the background? Yeah. Like, I suppose it's your your like what we're trying to do uh, in some of the projects we've been involved in is we've given it, as well as having your DAC application. We've given it an accessibility specification at tender stage, and that includes things like your visual contrast, your 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 surface finishes, your your matte finishes, and things like that. So as well as having your DAC application, all the contractors are given an accessibility specification document. Now it's a high level document, but I suppose it's something that you can go back to them afterwards and say, look, you had this document. This yeah, is. Like, you have to pick by the architect or the interior designer whoever's working on the project. Yeah. Already gone through that process. Yeah. And it's potentially not read your document, and you don't know till you get there. And I suppose we're, we we are I suppose we're, we are I suppose part of our process now is and we, whereas we wouldn't have before is we're heavily involved in reviewing tender drawings. So you're reviewing everything from your your ironmongery schedules, your door schedules, your your you know, and you're you're incorporating the visual contrast as part of that process. So one of the bigger projects where we 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 reviewed everything from all their tender drawings. As part of the process, and we've ensured that, as on the tender and drawings, they put additional notes in relation to accessibility and so on. So that's what will happen on the bigger projects. You have to review everything to make sure you catch it. Otherwise, you're going to be, as you said, you're going to be going in two weeks before it's handover. Smaller projects, and we can't, we can't pay budget for that in your three proposals. Well, you can, but you won't get the job. Like, yeah. <laughs> so, like, we, again, that that healthcare facility that I'm looking at tomorrow. As part of the process, we had to review it, all of the of the, the the detailed drawings, you know. So, I suppose that's the problem. People think that, you know, is there a cost for accessibility? You know, you can do it cheaply if you want, but you're not going to get the end product, and it's going to cost you in the long run because you're going to end up ripping out all the grab rails and making the changes. So, I suppose it's about competition in the market as well, though, isn't it? Well, are you finding on the contractor side, are there efforts to knowledge in relation to accessibility mm, yeah. yeah I think there are uh, some of the contractors that we're working with I suppose they learned the hard way in some of the previous projects they've done and they're really trying to make sure that in new projects that they're working on that it's something they they address so again one or two that we've been working with would they are they are actually considering it but, but they have learned the hard way in that mm. it's cost them in previous projects you know yeah. so I'll finish on the design service question with you uh, in relation to the DAC approval process. Sorry, DAC approval process. Um, there have been times where we've seen uh, something that has been approved DAC, yeah. but isn't strictly compliant with what the CPA. Is there a good deal on that? Uh, I suppose you're the certifier at the end of the day, so it's up to you to demonstrate compliance with the regulations. So you're, you, we've had a, we've had. I suppose we've had a number of projects where we weren't working on a DAC, but we've come in afterwards to work for the client, and we've reviewed some of the accessibility stuff, and we would find the same, is that they may have been granted a DAC from the local authority, but there will be still errors in the drawings or errors in the reports. But I suppose in lots of the DAC applications, then it's very early on in the process as well. So you know you're saying my ex my toilets are going to be accessible, but you don't have the detailed drawings and stuff. So but it's up to you to demonstrate. If you're the ancillary certifier or design certifier, you are a sign certifier, it's up to you to demonstrate compliance with the regulations. Paul, oh, thanks for the talk. Uh, just a question on, I suppose, for the large, larger projects, are you using benchmarking as a, as a way to maintain compliance, let's say, so you don't find out you've got a number of uncompliant pods that are going for disabled access? Yeah, so a number of schools we're working on at the moment, so we're saying like it's part of the process and it's it's something we're we're working with at the moment is that they fit out one of the accessible toilets mm -hmm. and then we go down and we inspect that. And you if there's things wrong with that we catch it at that stage rather than having to 
go back and look at the six or seven or eight accessible toilets. So yeah, so there and there are one or two pro two projects that we've started that they're looking at a similar approach where they would fit out maybe one of the floors or one of the hotel bedrooms or student accommodation or whatever it is and then you go in you assess that and make sure everything is right there so i suppose it does save a lot of money in the long run if things are wrong you catch it on the first first run rather than at the end as you said yeah i suppose the other one is from like a fast track projects where um, you have fab shop drawings come out from the let's say the structural fabricator for the for the park end stairs the accessible stairs and of course, it goes to the CNS engineer, and the CNS engineer says, Yeah, right, you shouldn't fall down. But it might go to the architect, but often it doesn't go to the access component, it should be going. Yeah. And then the project. <laughs> Yeah, I suppose it, it all goes back to the question at the back, I suppose, is what level of involvement does the access consultant have? And if you price the job right, you're more than likely not going to get it because you're too dear. So it's how how do people value the accessibility consultant, you know? So I suppose that's the, the maybe the message, you know? Yeah. Uh, just one there, if, if you were to have a, a high-rise building, say 19, 20 stories with small footprints, and you would have say three to four lifts. Is there a requirement that the stairs, you have a number of stairs, that one of those stairs must be ambient compliant? Yeah, so at least one stair has to be ambient disabled in, a, in right. the building. Even though you've got lift access to be Yeah. Lowered. Yeah. Right. So the requirement. Why is that though? Because I can understand if the one lift can one stair on the, on the lift breaks down, say, yeah. Program, but if there's three different lifts and the footprint of this is, is extremely small. And on the project, like if you try and leave mass there in the middle, yeah, it mustn't be that small if it's 19 floors, is it? <laughs> Good print would be small as well. Um, I, I suppose the whole idea of the part M ambulance to stay with stairs is that it's 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 a safer stairs for people to use, you know, and it's got you've got your, your 300 going means that you can actually rest on the, on the stairs and stuff. I know what you're saying. I, I, I suppose the question is, is there some people that won't, won't want to use a lift and prefer, would prefer to use a stair yeah, rather than a lift, it's, you know? It's, to be honest, if I'm working on any floor above third floor... Yeah, that's, be, that's fair enough, yeah, yeah, yeah. I suppose the, the guidance says, yeah. to meet the requirements, you have yeah. to provide one ambulance to save a stair within the building. What's the back going to say? And if the back goes in... I suppose if, if the back goes in, like the feedback we're getting from the local council, you have to meet your, your fire start and you have to meet your back. And if the back comes back, it would be unlikely that you'll get the back approved without it though, in order to meet part M. But if you do get it approved, I mean, if you get the back approved without the stairs, yeah. then could you turn around and say, well, I'm, I'm meeting compliance with my back, which is what I'm mandatorily required to do? No, I suppose you're, you're, mandatory, you're mandatory required to comply with part M of the building regulations. Well, your not DAC... Technical, not technical guidance, document M, no. No, part not M. Yeah, yeah, part M, yeah. That's so, if, so if I proposed to destroy drawings as compliant to part M and the building is all we accept it. Yeah. It. yeah. The, the other way you could look at that possibly, and without knowing the case, is the other way you could look at that is, as Conan is saying, is it's about compliance with part M of the building regulations. And you, if you can demonstrate compliance with Part M by using an alternative, you may apply for a relaxation, or you may explain that in your DAC application, and the building control authority may may say, right, that's fine, you have the lift access, but you need to apply for a relaxation of the requirements of Part M for the for the stairwell, you know. So I would probably recommend the pre consultation with the building control authority in that, that instance, you know. Another common one would be in a retail unit where you have to a series of vials, I suppose, um, and you're teaching a turning circle of 1800. <coughs> if you've got a retail unit that's only, say, 100 to 120 square meters in, in the floor area, if you're to have three or four vials within that unit, and all of a sudden you've, a, you've an 1800 turning circle with a really sort of 90 degree angle or whatever it may be, it's, the size of your unit isn't big enough to have that, you know, is there any sort of yeah, well, it's, what I'd say is you need to look at the British standard in that instance yeah. in relation to the design of retail units. So, again, I suppose the oils isn't really a circulation, it's not a corridor in, yeah. in the building. So that's the way I'd look at it is how you design your retail unit to to provide access. And customer services may be a way of overcoming some of the issues there. But 
I think you need to look at the the British standard and, and go yeah. to the guidance on retail units there as well. It just talks about bars. Yeah, it doesn't talk about shops, no. It talks about yeah. shops at all. And it just mentions, I suppose, the main reception area and the main foyer of, a, of a, I'd say, an office development or a hotel and stuff like that. So just the main reception is the one that they say has to have a lower counter and stuff. But again, I would say I would be going looking at what's good practice, which would be either the British standard or your building for everyone and stuff like that. But you'll find it you'll find it difficult enough, I suppose, to find stuff on retail units. There's you know, there is stuff there in building for everyone and there is stuff there in, in the in the British standard, but they're the two guys I'd recommend you to go to, I suppose. As an example, you would suppose if we've come across where say like a gift shop may have three or four different counters within that unit itself. Um, that sell different items. Do those counters then have to be compliant by each each individual counter? Yeah. Like in in if you if you think about this in practice, like or in 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 practical terms, any of the guy any of the the when we do the, we do disability awareness training, which is like training for frontline staff who may work in retail units or may work in 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 restaurants and hotels and stuff yeah. like that. And any of the guidelines that talk about customer services will tell people if you have a high counter. You walk around the front of the high counter, and you can deal. You can assist your customer in who's in the wheelchair in that instance. And all you need to have is, like in a hotel reception, you'd have a some hard surface where they can actually sign in, or they can pay by credit card and stuff like that. So, uh, like a lot of that would go down to practical implementation. It's just as well as it's we've as well as I've experienced it depends who you deal with in the building. Building, yeah. But I just give you the example. We did a recent retail unit in a small retail unit within a shopping centre, mm -hmm. and we put in. A, a, there was part of the process was the fit out of the main the main unit itself. So we put in a high counter, and at the side of that we put in a low counter. We had we had knee recess. It had a low counter for wheelchair mm -hmm. users. It had a hearing induction loop. There was three changing rooms within it. One of the changing rooms was fully accessible. It had a drop down seat. It had a bell to call someone for assistance and had coat hooks at low hands, low heights and grab rails. So there is guidance to say, look, it, it, it's a bit like saying TGM is silent, silent, silent in the design of a leisure facility, as in how do you gain access into a swimming pool? But you can go and find the guidance to say you either put in a hoist or you put in ramped access or you put in, you know, a, a floor. So it's a that would be a key message as well, is that like TGM talks about ramps and circulation and lifts and stuff like that. In some instances, it's silent in the key facilities that people are coming to use, which is the aisles, which is the let swimming pool, which is the conference facilities, and so on. So just try and find the other guidance that that's there yeah. to assist you as well. You know. Sorry, someone like, like that small unit we spoke about there in the shopping centre. Yeah. The rear exit from that shop onto a corridor. Would you say that that rear lobby should be quite uncompliant? It could be a small unit, so would you kind of about your wheelchair access, it could be for a little cafe or a little coffee shop, which predominantly maybe case that the staff are wheelchair bound. Yeah, I suppose it's it's looking at if it's a, if it's a lobby <laughs> that is to be accessed by a wheelchair user, then it should be compliance with was it diagram eleven of yeah, TGDM. Where if it's not a lobby that's going to be used by a wheelchair user, like for example, a lobby into a male toilet doesn't need to be the, the full size and things like that. But you're talking about an exit, are you? Yeah, just an exit, just an emergency exit if there's a problem with the main at the front. So what what will happen in that instance is that the double doors will open and then the next set of double doors will probably open. In there are little single doors, some small units that are less than 50 people in okay. the coffee shop. And the, o and the only time the wheelchair user would be using that door is if they're escaping out of the yeah, building. Yeah. So they'll be going, the door will be pushed out in the direction, they'll go straight through and straight through again. Yeah, so a 90 degree one, for example, and you wouldn't have the... 1500 clearance, clearance. and have you enough space for the wheelchair user to come in and turn and stuff? You'd have to see it really to be honest, like, yeah. you know, without giving you wrong advice. You well, know what I mean? Well, would you suggest that it should be part of compliant, fully compliant? Go back to what you've said there, I've taken note there. Fire exits need to be accessible. Yeah, if you go to if you go to page 18 of TGDM, yeah. it says it says externally approach routes that are leading to fire assembly uh, <laughs> areas need to be accessible. But if you go to page 38 of TGM, it says that all entrances need to be accessible, including subsidiary entrances, which if you go to point F of that, it, it says fire exits as well. So. But then, but then that would lead to a few steps 
on all of those and to the relax and to take the fire steps. Yeah. Should they all be part of the flying steps? That's what the TGD says. If you interpret it directly, that's what it says, yeah. It's so, no, no, I suppose that's what it does say. If you if you actually interpret TGDM, it says page 18 is the the route from the exit door to the assembly point needs to be accessible. And if you interpret page 38, it says all exits need to be accessible. Just on the, just on the ramps side of things, I know you, you did mention the one in 21, but I suppose the, the knock on effect of the builder doesn't do it right and what it seems to be here out for as 20 looks all of a sudden as 100 looks yeah. or self leveling compound. <laughs> that's what you need to if as an ancillary certifier you need to be I suppose saying to people that if they're if you're proposing 1 is to 21 then you need to achieve 1 is to 21 in sight and you need to make sure that the contractor is happy that he's going to achieve that that, but, that then brings in the accessibility consultant into the setting and validation or or a survey is provided to this accessibility consultant for validation you know what I mean yeah. say, look, it's, it's happening well, we've had we've had one of the schools we're working at at the moment in the courtyards and has one as a twenty one and our biggest concern back on in writing was, are you happy that you're going to achieve one as a twenty one, you know? And it's a bit of a cop out really going from one as a twenty to one as a twenty one because they're still effectively probably too right. steep. Like yeah, yeah. So I we'd be we'd always advise over one as twenty five and that allows for a margin of error, you know. So but one your it's dangerous territory. I would say one as twenty one. Yeah. Any more questions? Just going back on to what you were saying about the fire exits, um, you're saying it should be the and it says that they should all be accessible. Yeah. And in practice, for the job that you're doing, are you? Yeah, we had a job yesterday uh, where we were, it's a apartment complex and a fairly big apartment complex, and it had two, we did their accessibility review initial planning drawings, and we did a review, and there was two exits that were. That were stepped access only, and we went to the met, met with the architect, and we just said, "Look, how are you addressing accessibility here?" And they'd actually worked at achieving out the providing level access from the external. But I would say the majority, yes, of providing level access from the exits that we've been working on. But it was a bit of slope in the natural slope in the ground level from one side of the building to the other. Yeah, you're you're going to have. Uh, I think it's like it's if I go back to my conclusion, there's a number of key areas where guidance is lacking. That's one of them. And I suppose that and without trying to I, I, you've asked me three questions and I fudged each one of them, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So but I, I, I would strongly think that is one of the areas where there there needs to be a bit more of a steer from maybe the Department of Environment on is do all of those exits need to provide level access. For example, if there's I can think of one or two examples where we don't have fully level access, where there are steps from, but they put refuge areas in the in the area, in the actual yeah. external landings. Like. It's not refuge areas at the upper floors. Yeah, anyway. yeah. Well, I can think of one. I can just as you said it. I can think of one project at the moment where we have on a ground floor where we have an exit out onto an area which is above the street level, and there is a refuge area externally, and there's stepped access down, and no ramp. So yeah. Uh, so maybe I've answered one of your questions. <laughs> that external refuge area then has that got a call point? I don't think I don't think it's gonna have a call point now. Yeah, you're no. reliant yeah. on walk around the managed the situation. Person. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose I throw it out there is a question that maybe one of you hopefully can come back and answer for me, you know. <laughs> do do all those do all those exits need to have do they all need to provide level access? And maybe it's something for your group to maybe to Come up with an answer to you know. Is there a conflict by saying that all those exits need to be fully fully accessible? If there are only only going to be exits used, maybe you know there will be a, there will be a fire warden system in place or whatever the evacuation strategy is. The wheelchair users in, it potentially isn't going to be left. <coughs> at the, it could be somebody left working at night in an office. Of course it could, yeah, yeah. I suppose that's the same about what happens if they if they, you can't use the lift in the, in a fire situation. I think that's one of the biggest problems for people in wheelchairs. I suppose um, if they are working above ground floor level, is that the nine times out of ten the lift is not going to be able is not going to be an evacuation lift. So, do you want to use the evacuation chair?
talk to nine, nine out of ten wheelchair users, they say no. So it's one of the big other key issues there that I left out. Would it be as part of your um, consultancy on to due diligence on, I suppose, existing buildings that have been set up? Yeah, we've done due diligence yeah, on on existing buildings yet, yeah, whether it's for purchasers or for. Have you known any situations where like a council, some of the council has come out and and uh, taken up a building owner with the lack of uh, there there have been cases I suppose prior to building control amendment regulations where building control has come out and sort of enforcement on bars and restaurants and things like that. For example, one bar I know that they they had a, a, a door leading to a, a storage area which was which was um, signed as the accessible toilet, so um, but there have been there have been enforcement notices served by Dublin City Council on a number of premises in relation to accessibility. They're nearly too busy now to, to be picking up things that aren't being fought on on building and roads. That's, that's, that's what I'm not talking about. As in carrying out inspections, is it? Yeah, like they're, they're, what I mean by that is they're, they're flat out trying to do things that Yeah, of course they are. They're not, they're not probably carrying out inspections. Yeah. Enforcement as much yeah. as they are. I had a, a disabled client that was flagged as an issue by the, by the village go on, the, on a B-car bill where you go back, go back to your point about the lift and the black hole. So the architect had specified a black tile on the floor of the toilet, yeah. uh, which came off the lobby, which had black tile. The uh, village go officer came up with it, it would be a black hole. We had white walls and black floor, so we had 100%. Yeah, yeah, visual conscious, LOD. yeah. yeah. But, uh, and it does it go back to your point of it depends on the building control officer you may yeah. get, you know? So that's very much Yeah. Depends who you get on the bids. Yeah, I didn't think I'd be that popular for questions for <laughs> <laughs> half an hour or so. It's a difficult it's a difficult thing, I think, to send off part of it. Yeah. And I suppose everyone wants it done for nothing as well, you know. Thank you very much, Owen. Thanks very much. Thank you for that. Um, Owen has agreed to have a slide put up on the Engineers Ireland website. Also, there will be a, a copy of the of the video of this on the YouTube channel, Engineers Ireland YouTube channel, if anyone wants to look back at it as well. Um, we have, uh, I know February, uh, our lecture, I think, is on photovoltaic cells and fire safety issues associated with them. I'm not certain about the January lecture yet. That's yet to be agreed. Um, but, uh, so that, that would be notifications for that. Okay. So maybe you might just show your appreciation to. <laughs>